Would you like to know how to be happy? Well, the answer, believe it or not, is known. You may already know it. It took one of the most brilliant minds ever to appear on the earth to come up with the answer. His name was John Stuart Mill, who lived from 1806 to 1873, became an outstanding philosopher and economist. He's believed to have had perhaps the highest IQ of any person who has ever lived. So unless you think you're smarter, pay attention. John Stuart Mill said, Those only are happy who have their minds fixed on some object other than their own happiness. On the happiness of others, on the improvement of mankind, even on some art or pursuit. Followed not as a means, but as itself an ideal end. Aiming thus at something else, they find happiness by the way. Okay, to my mind, there's no doubt whatever that that is the true and only lasting path to lasting and meaningful happiness. The definition is so excellent, and people so often seem to be confused as to what happiness is all about. Let me repeat it. Those only are happy who have their minds fixed on some object other than their own happiness, on the happiness of others, on the improvement of mankind, even on some art or pursuit, followed not as a means, but as itself an ideal end. Aiming thus at something else, they find happiness by the way. I wonder why that isn't taught in school. I believe it's safe to say that not one person in 5,000 could give you an intelligent definition of what true happiness is all about. We must have our minds fixed on something other than happiness in order to find it. If we seek it directly, it will elude us forever. People say, I want to be happy as though it's something that can be done to them whether they do anything about it or not. Such people can never know happiness until they break out of the tiny world of themselves. Those only are happy who have their minds fixed on some object other than their own happiness. Therein lies the secret. The happiest people are usually the busiest people, almost always those whose business consists of serving others in some way. By losing themselves in what they're doing and where they're going, happiness quietly joins them and becomes a part of them. The miserable, unhappy people who cause such misery and unhappiness to others are the self-centered people, people who worry constantly about what they're getting out of it, rather than what they're giving. And the world is chuck-a-bang full of them. Unfortunately, we, we see their harried, unhappy, furtive, ferret-like faces everywhere, pushing, their grasping hands extended. They fear life, they fear death, they're the pitiful caricatures of humanity, and they pay a terrible price for their ignorance. All right, no more mystery then as to what happiness is all about. If you're not happy, it's because you're not meeting John Stuart Mill's simple directions and definition. If you do qualify, you're a happy person. The thing I like about the definition, other than the fact that it's the best I've ever found, is that it places a responsibility for happiness directly where it belongs. I was staying at a resort hotel, the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island in northern Michigan. One evening after dinner, I settled myself comfortably in a chair on the porch that runs the entire length of the old frame hotel. Supposedly, it's the longest porch in the world, just to relax and enjoy the delightful evening. There was a light breeze and a good moon. The lake was beautiful, and the lights of the passing ships could be seen. The evergreens stood out clearly in the moonlight, and it was altogether one of those really great times you remember. Before long, a young couple came strolling down the long porch. They were walking arm in arm, and I thought that they were all that was needed to make the picture complete. They walked slowly by me and then took seats not far away. They were silent for a moment, and I naturally thought that they were enjoying the remarkable beauty of the scene and the night as much as I was when the young woman spoke. I know these were her exact words because I wrote them down as soon as I could stop laughing. She said, I hate the smell of horses. There are no automobiles on Mackinac Island. All the transportation is done with horses, and they naturally lend their own unique flavoring to the island's atmosphere. I found it charming, and a lot less irritating than the noise and fumes of cars, taxis, and trucks. But what made me laugh, of course, was that in the midst of all that beauty on one of the most beautiful evenings of the year, in so romantic and charming a setting, the only thing the young woman noticed that was worth mentioning was the faint odor of horses. They looked at me in surprise when I laughed, so I had to explain why, which neither of them found to be amusing at all. In fact, the young woman seemed somehow offended, and they, they soon moved away from the strange character who not only eavesdropped, but also laughed at them. The sad thing about it all was that the attractive young woman belongs to that vast army whose members make it their business to spend their lives focusing on the wrong things. I'll bet if the young man gave her a string of pearls, she'd busy herself with a minute inspection of the clasp. On a beautiful day, 
Such people can spot that tiny cloud on the horizon. They don't appreciate the good qualities in people, but complain about their defects. If their children bring home report cards with five B's and one C, it's the C that'll get the comments and the attention. They don't look for what's right, but what's wrong. In a world of miracles and beauty, they see only horse droppings. If you mention this to them, they'll usually say you have your head in the sand, and they have it all backwards. There's nothing in the world that's perfect, and it's our job to eliminate as many defects as we can, but pity the poor people who go through life seeing only the fly specks on the window of the world. We speak of recreation without being mindful of its original meaning, its real meaning, which is to recreate oneself. Recreation should be recreation, a time so spent that we can reevaluate things, our lives, our work, our goals, our reasons for living, our service, our contribution, our education, our hobbies, our enjoyment of ourselves and others. A round of golf, great as it is, simply is not time enough nor a few sets of tennis or an afternoon poking around in the garden. We need more time than that. Several days, a couple of weeks or longer, and on a regular basis. For me, it's getting on the water in a boat. It's wearing comfortable old clothes and sailing out of sight of land with just the sea and the wind and the sky, and it's puttering and fixing things around the boat, sanding and varnishing and making little improvements. There's the therapy of the fresh air, the sea itself, the elements, and it's using your two hands, the most versatile instruments on earth, and the tools they've fashioned to help. Everyone has his own way, or should have his own way, of recreating himself, of renewing himself, so that he can turn again to the necessary pursuits of living with new interest and enthusiasm. What's yours? With one friend of mine, it's growing tomatoes. For others, it's painting, or cooking, or mountain climbing, or fishing, or camping, or traveling. Everyone needs recreation in its true sense. Robert Ardrey points out in his marvelous book, The Social Contract, that the three most important factors to any human being are, in this order, number one, identity, recognition as a separate, original human being. Number two, stimulation, change, the opposite of boredom. And number three, security, the opposite of anxiety. Well, this recreation business comes under headings one and two and most certainly helps us establish number three. That is, occasional renewal helps us find ourselves, reestablish just who we are and what we want. So it helps with our identity problem. It most certainly involves change, stimulation, the opposite of boredom. And it helps us develop inner security, the only kind that's worth anything anyway. If a person has this inner security, real security as a person. His world can come crashing down all around him and he can still emerge secure within himself and build a new and possibly better one. So when you find yourself getting stale, you need some meaningful recreation. You need to stop the world and get off for a while and look back at it as a man from Mars might. It's surprising the new ideas you'll get and good ones, the new opportunities you'll see. Opportunities that have been lying about in your own backyard, in your own work and world that you were a little too close to the forest to see before. And when you're lost in the recreation you love, you're really living. You're living as fully as it's possible to live. And you know, that's the whole idea, isn't it? Have you noticed how most people seem to be waiting to be happy in the future? They seem to be so intent on getting through the day, they forget to enjoy it. It's as though happiness is a distant city to them, a city they're striving to reach. But happiness is something that must be learned and practiced if we're to become skilled at it. Pushing it out into the indeterminate future involves running the risk that we won't know how to be happy when we get there. It's like saying, someday when I can afford to buy a piano, I'll sit down and play beautiful music. It doesn't work that way. Owning a piano doesn't confer the knowledge of how to play. And arriving at a particular stage of life, whether it's measured in terms of age or income, doesn't mean that we'll suddenly become happy people. A reporter interviewing J. Paul Getty, who could at that time have cashed in his chips for several billion dollars, asked, Mr. Getty, what is it that money cannot buy? And he replied, I don't think it can buy health, and I don't think it can buy a good time. Some of the best times I ever had didn't cost me any money. The fact is that most of the ingredients necessary for happiness are present in the lives of most people every day. They're things and conditions for which we need not wait. They're ours today. And most of them are things we're so used to, we take them for granted. They're the people with whom we live and work, our children, our homes. There's the anticipation of the day and what it will bring. 
the opportunity to work well and honestly so that we can take pride and satisfaction from it and by so doing enjoy our leisure and our rest. There's the happiness that should come from being with our friends and our neighbors. And the thoughtful person finds happiness in just being alive. He enjoys walking on a sunny day, but he likes to walk in the rain, too. He can find happiness from the sound of the surf or the crackling of a fire. Abraham Lincoln said that people are about as happy as they make up their minds to be. And that seems to be it, the making up of the mind. Happy people are happy most of the time, and it must be because they just made up their minds that the alternative doesn't hold much hope or fun. If a person must wait until something happens to him to make him happy, he's not going to get much fun out of life. Happiness should not be just the reaction to an outside stimulus. Rather, it should be a state of mind, a regular condition that will fail at times because of unfavorable outside stimulus. Now, when you practically tear your little toe off walking barefoot through a darkened room, you're not going to be the happiest person in the neighborhood for the next ten minutes. Life is full of things that can cause our happiness, our sense of well-being, to evaporate for a while. Knowing that sorrow and disappointment are natural and inevitable conditions of life, let's let them be the stimuli to break our happiness, rather than leaving it the other way around, the way so many seem to have it. So, be happy now. A person can go a long way toward alleviating and understanding his discontent if he will understand the perverse nature of the human being. When a person works too hard or just works for a long, steady time, he becomes discontented and wants rest and relaxation. When he relaxes too long, he seeks work. When he's around too many people for too long, he longs for solitude. When he's alone too long, he longs for human companionship. The young envy the older person and long for the years to quickly pass. The older envy the young and often wish they could somehow turn back the clock of time. You'll be a lot happier and have a much better sense of humor if you'll understand that it's an integral and indissoluble part of human nature to become dissatisfied, to want what you don't have at the moment. Moments of complete and blissful satisfaction are wonderful but rare and soon give way to a nagging desire for something else. And that's good. If we understand this part of ourselves, we can avoid frustration. It is this godlike discontent that lurks in the growing person that's responsible for all human progress. That our discontent is also responsible for a great deal of pain and unnecessary suffering is simply the other side of the coin. Do you remember the old fable about the fisherman who caught a magic prince in the form of a fish? And the fish told the fisherman that if he let him go, the fish would grant any wish. The fisherman let him go, talked it over with his wife, and they started wishing. Each time their wish was granted, they then wished for something greater. Finally, they lived in a great, gleaming castle with hundreds of servants. But it wasn't enough. The wife wanted then to control the sun, to make it obedient to her whim. And when the fisherman asked for this wish, the finny prince was disgusted and took away everything. They were once again in the simple shack. Like so many old fables, it's a commentary on human nature, and it comes uncomfortably close to the truth. We say, if only I had such and such, I'd be completely happy for the rest of my life. It isn't true. As soon as we have such and such for a while, a surprisingly short while, we then want something else. Discontent comes with the territory. It comes with being human. Are you discontented? If you are, that's good. That's why we're not still squatting in a filthy, drafty cave and grunting and scratching. Divine discontent, to understand it, is to use it properly. Let me give you some tips on how to be miserable. And don't laugh. There are literally millions of people who wouldn't trade their daily misery for all the gold in the world. You may know some of them. In fact, if you know ten people, you probably know several of them. This may be an exaggeration, and it may not, too. The first step to real, professional-type, solid, unremitting misery is to get all wrapped up in yourself and your problems, real or imagined. Become a kind of island surrounded on every side by yourself. By turning all of your thoughts inward upon yourself, you can naturally not spend much or any time thinking of others and other things. And so finally the outside world, the real world, will disappear into a kind of Hitchcock-type fog. You'll know the world is there because every once in a while you'll bump into it. 
but for the most part it will be murky and indistinguishable. And it's right here that you have to understand an important but little known fact. The type of person who turns inward upon himself doesn't have much in the wisdom department or he'd never do it. And as a result, he doesn't have much to turn inward upon. He finds a kind of vacuum, so he must then invent things. And he invents things like the world is against him, which is the worst possible kind of conceit. The world isn't against him, it doesn't even know he exists. And as a result, it ignores him completely. So since this person doesn't get much attention from this attitude, he tries to get attention through various other means. One is to hunt for illnesses of various kinds. If you look long enough, and it doesn't take long, you can find symptoms of any condition or disease known to man, and some that are unknown, ranging from yaws to rabies. With your newfound illness, you've got something with which you hope to make everyone else as miserable as you are. So you tell them about it. They don't want to hear about it, but you tell them anyway. And you watch for signs of sympathy. And at first you get them. So you think you've got it made, and, and you keep this up with new and interesting medical problems. You wake up every morning feeling rotten, and you let the world know about it. But soon you detect a change. People begin to walk away as you approach. They don't want to hear your deadly recitation anymore. Even your family turns an uninterested deaf ear to your protestations of being on the brink of a slow and painful death. Well, this makes you angry. So childlike, you cry out that nobody cares whether you live or die, and by this time you're pretty close to the truth. So the bitterness deepens, the misery thickens, and you draw farther and farther back into your cave, shouting imprecations at the world, throwing an occasional stone at a passerby, and in general, making a complete ass of yourself. Well, there you have it. One of the best and most common formulas for being miserable, and making those around you miserable as well. And it all starts with becoming too wrapped up in yourself, feeling that you're important somehow. Samuel Johnson wrote, Many of our miseries are merely comparative. We are often made unhappy not by the presence of any real evil, but by the absence of some fictitious good. And a Hindu proverb says, The miserable are very talkative. And they are, aren't they? I ran across something interesting called the master word. It's about a word that will work wonders for a person, regardless of his age or what he does with his days. Man, woman, or child, the master word will bring meaning and usefulness into his or her life, new clarity and self-respect and satisfaction into the passing days. This was written by the great physician, Sir William Osler. Though little, the master word looms large in meaning. It is the open sesame to every portal the great equalizer, the philosopher's stone which transmutes all base metal of humanity into gold. The stupid, it will make bright, the bright, brilliant, and the brilliant, steady. To youth, it brings hope, to the middle-aged, confidence, to the aged, repose. Do you know what the master word is? Well, guess. I used it in my opening comments today. Did you recognize it? Well, the master word is work. I've talked about this before, but it's been said that we need reminding as much as we need educating. Human beings have the strangest and most perverse tendency to take the best parts of life for granted. In fact, the human being has the capacity to take anything, no matter how great it might be, for granted once he becomes used to it. The actor in front of the cameras, the captain of a great ocean liner, the man at the controls of a giant earth-moving machine, the writer, the painter, the mother all seem to let the charm and excitement of their work fade after a while until it becomes as humdrum to them as candling eggs. William Osler and the other great men of the past and present knew the real value of work, not just its value to those who benefit from it, but its incalculably great value to the person performing it. These people seem to have the capacity for never taking their work for granted. Instead, they found it filled with interest and reward, and became great because they did. I was talking not long ago with a top executive of one of our major oil companies. He had started his career working as a helper in a service station of the company whose nationwide sales he now directs. Why did he happen to see so much opportunity, adventure, and reward hidden in what the average person would consider to be the most menial and uninteresting work? It makes you wonder how... How many young men in the same work today are looking beyond the gas tank they're filling or the windshield they're cleaning? And it makes you wonder, too, how a person can take his most precious possessions for granted until they become dull and dreary or lose their charm and become uninteresting. His loved ones, his home, his health, his abilities, and his work. 
What happened to the excitement of the first days, when his wife, his home and children, and his work were new in his life? Like the finest silver, these valuable things need regular polishing, and regardless of what it is we do with our days, they should be kept as bright as they were in the beginning. In this way, they can lead us to the new and even more interesting years ahead. Dr. Paul Shearer, speaking of Job's impatience to get immediate and direct answers to his question, said, Greatness and peace and happiness are simply not proper ends for any human soul to set for itself. They are the byproducts of a life that is held steady like a ship at sea to some true course worth sailing. Terrific, isn't it? Greatness and peace and happiness are not proper ends for any human soul to set for itself. They are the byproducts of a life that has held steady like a ship at sea to some true course worth sailing. In other words, if the course to which you're holding is right, everything else you want will come as byproducts. Some true course. How does a person find some true course worth sailing? I remember some time back a man came to me for advice on how he might become a popular sought-after platform speaker. He told me he enjoyed making speeches and wanted to make a career of it. I asked him what he wanted to say and drew a complete blank. It became clear that he was ready to speak on any subject the entertainment committee wanted him to speak on. It wasn't the subject. It was just that he wanted to make speeches. I told him that he'd never become a great and sought-after speaker until he had something he wanted very much to say, something inside of him that burned to get out, that he felt needed telling. Speakers become great because of what they want to say. Greatness follows the zeal of their subject. And it's the same with some other true course worth sailing. A person needs to find the course in which he can lose himself, dedicate himself, and then the greatness and the peace and the happiness will come to him naturally as the bee comes to the blooming flower or a child runs to its parents. People who find their lives filled with confusion and uncertainty, with boredom and unhappiness, need to find a meaningful vehicle for their lives, something in which they can lose themselves completely. It needn't be some great cause, although it can be. It can be found usually in our present work as a rule. It needs only be ferreted out. We need to know, we need to become, in the words of Dr. Maslow, self-actualizing. We need to become people who are steadily moving toward fulfillment, toward personal enrichment. Dr. J. Wallace Hamilton puts it pretty well when he asks and answers his own question. He writes, what then are the basic laws of happiness and how do we learn them? I suppose the clearest law upon which there is fundamental agreement is that this inner music of the soul which we've named happiness is essentially and inevitably a byproduct, that it comes invariably by indirection. To pursue it, to pounce upon it, to go directly after it, is the surest way not to obtain it. People who make a mission of seeking happiness miss it, and people who talk loudly about the right to be happy seldom are. It's a byproduct, an agreeable thing added in the pursuit of something else. Way back in the days of sailing ships, sailors who ventured into Antarctic waters would occasionally see a strange and awe-inspiring sight. They'd see a great iceberg towering high out of the sea, moving against the wind. Now, since they depended upon the wind to drive their ships, they were keenly aware of its direction. And to see this great, shining, apparently inanimate monolith of ice moving mysteriously into the teeth of the wind was, to them, uncomfortably curious. It was not until much later that students of the sea learned of the great currents which, like titanic rivers, moved their mysterious ways through the body of the sea. These icebergs, some so huge that it took days to sail past them, had their roots, 90% of their bulk, caught in these great currents, and they moved majestically along their way regardless of the winds and tides on the surface. I like this story because to me it's a wonderful example of the way a person should live his life. A person should have his roots deep in a great moving current, a moving stream of conscious direction which will keep him on course, sailing steadily toward the destination he's chosen, regardless of the economic and social winds that blow first this way and then that on the surface. In such a life, there's no great hurry, no frantic running about, no doubt or confusion. Instead, each day he moves a little way along his course, steadily, unrelentingly. In one day, he doesn't seem to make much headway to the casual observer, but like the iceberg, if you come back in a week, you'll no longer find him at the exact latitude and longitude of a week ago. And in a year, he'll have covered a really marvelous distance. While most of those about him will still be moving in circles and by fits and starts. 
They'll go tearing past him one day like the hare sped by the turtle, if you don't mind my mixing my metaphors. But he plods steadily on, never looking back, thoroughly enjoying the trip. And above all, he has the wonderful calm knowledge of his destination and knows that each day finds him closing the distance that still separates him from it. Sometimes in his life, as in all lives, there are storms which tend to throw him off course and obstacles which for a time may delay him. But soon, he's right back on course again, moving ahead. This is the life of the strong, serene person, the person of wisdom, the person who knows that he cannot do or become everything in his lifetime, so calmly chooses that which he desires and which best fits his proclivity, pushing everything else from his mind, and begins his life's journey. The life of such a man or woman always demonstrates the almost unbelievable cumulative effect of time well spent. His steady, unswerving use of time seems to make it compound until, in a very few years, he's miles ahead of all but the few who live as he does. He's like that great iceberg. His roots are firmly held by the steady stream of his belief. Emerson taught, A point of education that I can never too much insist upon is this tenet that every individual man has a bias which he must obey, that it is only as he feels and obeys this that he rightly develops and attains his legitimate power in the world. There are few things more interesting than words. Here's one you can add to your vocabulary and to your way of life if you want to. The word is serendipity. S-E-R-E-N-D-I-P-I-T-Y. Serendipity. The meaning of serendipity, according to the Oxford Dictionary, is the faculty of making happy and unexpected discoveries by accident. And it means also the good things that almost always happen to a person following a bold course of action. Serendipitous things. The word was coined by the British author Horace Walpole, who based it on the title of an old fairy tale, The Three Princes of Serendip. The princes in the story were always making discoveries of things they were not in quest of. Let's say you're trying to invent something. Frequently, you will stumble onto something entirely different and wonderful that you had no idea of discovering. Well, that's what serendipity means. Now, the point I want to make is that you wouldn't have made the serendipitous discovery if you hadn't been looking for something else. I'll bet you've heard people say of someone, that's the luckiest guy in the world. But if you'll get to know the man, you'll usually find he's a busy, positive kind of individual who's always looking for new and interesting ways of doing things. Someone wants to define luck as something you find when preparedness meets opportunity. It just won't happen usually unless a person prepared for it. There are lots of interesting and pretty wonderful things that would be happening all the time to a lot more people if people weren't such stick in the muds as a rule. Take the person who hates his work, for example. There are millions of people, I suppose, who actually hate, loathe the work they're doing. But they stay with it because of some warped sense of security. Now, if they'd find out what it is they really love to do and prepare themselves for it, they could cut loose from what they're doing now. And the minute they do, this word serendipity comes into action. The good things that happen to a person following a bold, positive course of action. It's frequently found that a lot of boredom and frustration in our work comes from not knowing enough about it. You'd be surprised at the number of people who know only their own job, and that in a limited way, and who have no idea what's going on in the rest of their business. Frequently, a person in any given line of work can find interest, challenge, and just the job he's looking for, right in his own business or industry, if he's just taken the time to find out more about it. One of the greatest explorers who ever lived, Captain James Cook, began as an ordinary seaman. In four years, he had learned enough to become a master of his own ship, and later made the discoveries that, of course, made him famous. A happy, successful, serendipitous life, beginning as a common seaman. Another common seaman, named Joseph Conrad, studied and worked his way to become a ship's captain, and later wrote the wonderful stories of the sea that made him loved and famous. There isn't a single line of work where this hasn't happened. I just picked beginning as a common seaman as an example, because that's fairly a, a small beginning. But the same applies to anything else. Serendipity. It's quite a word, and it'll apply to whatever you do for a living. Some time back, I was in San Diego for a meeting, and I met a wonderful young couple who'd been married only a few days. Handsome, young, intelligent. Well, it was a pleasure to see them together. After the meeting, they drove me back to my hotel in Mission Bay, and we got to talking about marriage. I mentioned to them what H.L. Mencken had said to reporters who asked him what he thought the secret to a happy marriage was. They had probably expected one of his devastating, iconoclastic comments, but his reply simply was, courtesy. 
There's the secret to happiness in marriage. I'm convinced of it. No matter how you turn that word, it comes out winning. The young couple was thoughtful, and they agreed with me. Courtship, marriage, should have its foundation on love and mutual respect. But the years ahead, a lifetime together, will depend upon that word Mencken passed along as the secret of a happy marriage. Courtesy. If a man and woman will be courteous to each other, they'll never take each other for granted. Their marriage will never become dull and common and stale. Courtesy is the thing that keeps a love fresh and alive. It's a strange thing, but if there's one person on the face of the earth you should show courtesy to, it should be the person to whom you're married, that person before anyone else. And yet, well, you know as well as I do that in all too many homes, that's the last person to be treated with courtesy, thoughtfulness, and respect. It takes thought and work to be courteous every day to the person you're married to, and that's exactly what makes a marriage work, thoughtfulness and working at it. People often think there's some kind of mystery to a really great and successful marriage. There's no mystery at all. Everything operates on the same law, cause and effect. The yard around your house will reflect exactly the care you're giving it. It can return to you in beauty and abundance no more than you put into it. It's impossible. It's the same with a, a job, a business, a human life, a marriage, with everything. No secret, no mystery. You can tell exactly, precisely, what people are putting into a marriage by observing what the marriage is returning to them. And the most important ingredient is courtesy. How do you feel toward anyone who treats you with courtesy and respect? You like that person, and you like to be around him. And when this same common sense is applied to the one person on earth you've decided to spend your life with, it takes on whole worlds of new meaning and builds a foundation of solid rock under the love you have for each other. The children grow up taking courtesy as a matter of course. They see the fine and gentle way their parents treat each other, and they'll know how to treat their partner someday. Courtesy, one word in the English language that can make of a marriage a thing of warmth and beauty if it's there, or a living hell if it isn't. Back in the days of ancient Rome, during the years of the Caesars, there was a person whose only job was to hold a laurel wreath over the head of the Caesar and from time to time intone the words, Thou art mortal. Now the purpose of this was to remind the man in whom such great powers resided that he too was, after all, only a man, and as such, mortal. When we're young, we tend to think of life as never-ending. Time for us stretches off limitlessly into the future. But as we get older, even in our forties, which should be a time of vigor, interest, and activity, really a time of young maturity, we begin to get from time to time small reminders of our mortality. Or oh, it might be a sudden shortness of breath or a perfectly normal twinge in the chest, a bit of back trouble. But we get these occasional reminders that time is not, after all, standing still for us, that we, like the Caesars of old, are indeed mortal. To the neurotic, this sort of reminder fills him with dread and plunges him into even deeper depression. But to the fairly normal, reasonably well-adjusted person, this comes as a reminder to enjoy to the fullest the time that is remaining, that days are not things to be waited through until Saturday or a birthday or Christmas, but rather to be savored and enjoyed one by one, hour by hour. We come to an understanding that to kill time, as we so aptly put it, is really nothing more than to kill a little part of ourselves, since time is all we have. It reminds us too, or at least it should, to be more patient, more tolerant of others, particularly those we love. If we're mature enough to love anyone, it means exactly that. And it reminds us to follow our hunches and obey our sudden impulses, especially those which involve a kind word or a pat on the back or a sign of tenderness. Those we love, as well as ourselves, are only passengers for the journey's duration. So let's let them know we enjoy sharing it with them. And if we don't always enjoy it, let's fake it. Let's pretend we do. After all, the trip really isn't all that long. I saw a newspaper picture not long ago of a woman of 75 ice skating. It reminded me that 75 is only old to people under 60. To people 75, it's a good, thoroughly enjoyable age, and maybe we'll all live to be 85 or 95, and maybe we won't. In any case, there is a limit, 
and there should be, or it wouldn't be there. And since there is, why not relax a little? Not take things too seriously. And as an old friend of mine once said, in a life where death is inevitable, never worry about anything. Sure, it's easier said than done. I remember reading a story about an old man who was planting a young tree in his yard. His neighbor hailed him and said, What are you planting the tree for? You'll never live to see it grown. And the old man calmly went on with his planting and said, I believe you have to plan on dying tomorrow or living forever. Well, I'm not planning on dying tomorrow. George Santayano once wrote that there's no cure for birth and death save to enjoy the interval. There's no cure for birth and death save to enjoy the interval. You know, it's being reminded of something like that which can shake a person up a little bit. Have you ever thought much about how much time we waste and unhappiness we bring on ourselves by worrying about the future and reliving in our minds the mistakes of the past? One of the neatest tricks in the world is to learn to enjoy the present, since the present is the only time we'll ever own. Distance is no longer a serious obstacle due to modern means of travel, but time remains unconquerable. It cannot be expanded, accumulated, mortgaged, hastened, or retarded. It's the one thing completely beyond man's control. And while the supply of time is certainly limited for anyone, generally it's squandered as though there's no end to it. The man on the commuter train, bored, waiting to get home, then waiting for dinner, then waiting to go to bed or for a particular television program, and he thus spends his time slightly behind reality, waiting for something that's coming up. And while it'll keep him going, he never or seldom learns to enjoy the time he's using right now. But what it takes seems to be an awareness of living. It means being aware that you're alive at this moment, and that the world and people are interesting enough at any time, so that we needn't waste so precious a thing as time in boredom. If we know where we're going in the future, we can do our work the best we can, give it everything we've got, and we don't need to worry about it or the future. And as for reliving our mistakes of the past, this is the easiest advice on earth to give, and probably the most difficult on earth to follow. Everybody knows that it's perfectly useless to relive in our minds the dumb stunts we've pulled in the past. But this doesn't keep us from doing it. And again, according to the experts, the solution may be found in living for the present and enjoying it as much as we can. Now, this does not mean that we should not plan for the future. We should. But once our plans are laid, fine. Work on them, but don't stew and fret over them. All we will ever have is today. Yesterday is gone forever, can never be recalled, and tomorrow really never comes. If we find it difficult to enjoy the day in which we're living, we should remember that what we're waiting for will be made up of the same kind of days we're getting now. Frequently, a person who's unhappy by nature will believe that when something happens in the future, such as marriage, a better job, more money, or whatever it happens to be, that he'll suddenly be a happy person. But the facts don't bear that out. If we're living in the past or worrying or hoping for happiness in the future, the best thing we can do is ask ourselves, how am I doing with the days I'm getting right now? How am I doing today? It's not how much we have, but how much we enjoy that makes happiness. Try that business of being aware of the present and its possibilities, and the chances are you'll enjoy it. The head of a great corporation died in his New York office of a heart attack. Later, when it came time to clean out his desk and collect his personal effects, a hand fishing line wrapped on a stick, complete with bobber, sinker, and rusted hook, was found in his bottom desk drawer. It was probably the one he had used as a small boy on the farm in the Middle West. Had that relic of younger carefree days represented his real dream of what living was all about? He had gone to school, found a job, got married, worked hard, purchased a home on the installment plan and the other niceties of living. Children had come along and there was their education to think about. There were the promotions that came from hard work and native ability and the passing of the years. There were the clubs and civic things, the professional associations, the crises on the job and at home. And finally, the top job with a company that had grown very much larger with the passing of 30 years. The top job with its responsibilities to stockholders, employees, customers, research and development, finance. The kids were out of school and married themselves now. It had all happened so fast and with no real plan of any kind. It had been school, then job, then work, then promotions and family and income problems. And suddenly, there he was on top of the pile. And rummaging in his things in the attic or the basement one day, he had come across that old worn-out fishing outfit with its tiny hook for bluegills and the red bobber with the paint all peeled off. The string had almost come apart in his hands, 
that he'd sat there and remembered that cool little creek with the summer smell of it and the green moss along the bank, the frogs plopping into the water and the water bugs skimming and the willows along the bank. He remembered the excitement of seeing that bobber suddenly disappear and the frantic tug of the fish on the line and finally a nice string of them for dinner. And suddenly he had wanted to go back. He had realized that that had been living that that had been real and elemental and, and satisfying, and somehow he hadn't done enough of it. He hadn't had the time to just go sit on a bank and fish for a while and chew on a twig and feel the sun on his back and wait for the barber to disappear. The time and the leisure to listen to the voice inside and get things straightened out in his mind as to what was important and what wasn't. Things like goals and roles. So someone had called him, and he'd put the fishing outfit in his jacket pocket, and he'd thought about the next morning, too, when he took the outfit to his office and looked at it again, and then finally put it down in that bottom drawer, tucked away, out of sight, but not out of mind. And then there'd been the coronary, and that had been the end of that. The fishing outfit was still in the bottom drawer, and when his wife went through the effects that they had sent home from the office, she sat with the fishing outfit in her hands for a long time. She saw him as a little boy, too, and maybe wondered why he'd followed the course he'd chosen. In interviews with very old people, people who realize that their remaining time is drawing to a close, you frequently hear them say, I waited too long to start living. When the researchers or others who hear this kind of response are young, they find it strange. But what these older people mean is that they often fail to enjoy life even during the years that they were living it most fully. And it seems that most people, during the richest and fullest years of their lives, fail to develop an awareness of living, an enjoyment of living. It's like the person who puts the best china and silver and linen away for some future time, or very special time, and dies before any of it's ever used. Or it's like the person who puts seat covers in his car and thus passes on to the second person to buy it brand new upholstery that he himself never used or enjoyed. And so millions of people, with the miracle of sight, never really see the world about them until it's practically too late. Millions with the inborn capacity to love and to know the joy that loving brings wait too long to express it. They live through the passing years without really being aware of their days, of the riches that are passing through their hands. Few people, it seems, develop an awareness of daily living. In possession of the miracle of life, they pass through their days like automatons. In possession of the greatest gift on earth, life itself. They tell us by their actions that they don't even know they have it and haven't the slightest conception of its value, let alone an awareness that it's to be enjoyed to the fullest every day. I remember reading an account of a famous show business personality, a woman of great talent, who, as she made the announcement of her impending fourth or fifth marriage, said, after all these years, I'm finally going to be happy. She thought another husband could somehow give her something she should have been enjoying all along. She obviously had no idea as to what happiness is, where it's to be found, or what living is all about. And she belongs to a big club. It's only when life is threatened that a conception of its value begins to dawn on the average person. A man plotted a kidnapping for months. His mind was filled with the thought of the million-dollar ransom he was going to get, more important to him, he thought at the time, than anything else on earth. Yet when he was surprised by the police, he dropped the suitcase containing the ransom and ran for dear life. Ran for dear life. It took the sudden threat of death to put things in their proper order for this poor, stupid person. It's amazing, isn't it, how few people seem to get the word. Most people place the greatest value on the cheapest things in life, while the greatest of all, life itself, goes unnoticed. The most fortunate people in the world are those who have the wisdom to place value where it belongs, those who have an awareness of life. I read a great Greek poem once by Kafafi titled, I believe it was titled, Journey to Ithaca something like that, which reminds us that it is the voyage and the adventures on the way that count, not the arrival itself. This seems to be the most difficult truth to understand. This is not to say that a man's goal in life is unimportant. On the contrary, it's vital. 
for without a goal or distant destination, we would not begin the trip at all. Instead of an odyssey, we'd have a running around in circles, an endless following of the shoreline around and around our tiny island. Every man needs a great and distant goal toward which to strive, but in traveling toward it, he should try to keep in mind that the fabled land he seeks has shores much like the one he left behind, that its purpose is not so much a resting place, but rather the reason for the trip. Where a person goes is not nearly as important as how he gets there. That a house is built is not important. It's the manner in which it's built that makes it great, poor, or average. That we live is not nearly as important as the manner in which we live. I think it's in misunderstanding this that often keeps people in a state of unhappiness and anxiety. They forget what they're really looking for, or what they really should be looking for, the discovery of themselves. This is the island toward which everyone should journey. It's a difficult journey, beset like the travels of Ulysses with many dangers and hardships, but it gives meaning to life, and there are many rich rewards to be found along the way. It means asking the questions that are hard to answer. Questions like, where am I going? Why am I going there? What is it that I really want? And why do I want it? Am I making the best possible use of myself as a person? Am I gradually realizing my real potential? Am I discovering my best talents and abilities and using them to their fullest? Am I living fully extended in my one chance at life on Earth? Am I really living? Who am I? These are the questions everyone must ask himself and find the answers to. As Emerson wrote, Though we travel the world over to find the beautiful, we must carry it with us, or we find it not. Whatever it is you're looking for must first be found within yourself, whether it be peace, happiness, riches, or great accomplishments. Everything we do outwardly is only an expression of what we are inwardly. To ask for anything else is as absurd as looking for apples on an oak tree. So the person who knows what he wants knows what he must become, and so he fixes his attention on the preparation and development of himself. And as he grows toward the ideal he holds in his mind, he finds interest, zest, and joy on the journey. He looks forward to tomorrow, but he also enjoys today, for it's the tomorrow he looked forward to yesterday. He knows that if he cannot find meaning and value in his present, it will very likely be missing from his future. Today is the future of five years ago. These are questions that need answering. Some 4,500 years ago, one of the most inspiring thoughts the world's ever produced was written in Sanskrit. And here's its translation. It goes, Look well to this one day, for it and it alone is life. In the brief course of this one day lie all the verities and realities of your existence, the pride of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty. Yesterday is only a dream, and tomorrow is but a vision. Yet each day well-lived, makes every yesterday a dream of happiness, and each tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this one day, for it, and it alone, is life. With that one bit of ancient philosophy and little else, a person could live an ideal and richly successful life. It applies to everyone in every walk of life, certainly the student, the teacher, the business person, the worker, whatever his task may be, the housewife, the politician, the clergyman. I remember reading somewhere about a businessman who visits his barber shop every morning for half an hour. He doesn't want to shave or haircut every morning. He lies stretched out in the chair with a hot towel on his face, not just because it's soothing and relaxing, but so no one will recognize and speak to him. And during that half hour, he gets himself organized mentally for the day ahead. Sounds like a good idea, but I think everyone could accomplish much the same thing by sitting quietly and slowly reading that great piece of wisdom from the Sanskrit. Look well to this one day, for it and it alone is life. It's true. Today, right now, it's all the life there is for any person on earth. We can look toward and plan for the future, certainly, but if we pass up living and enjoying today, we're passing up all we've got for something we hope to get. In the brief course of this one day lie all the verities and realities of your existence, the pride of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty. In reading and thinking of this, at the beginning of each new day, we could remind ourselves of these points. The truth and reality of our lives, in themselves a miracle. And we would remind ourselves of the duty to grow a little as persons, to rise above the petty and the trivial, to become stronger and more serene, 
and we would remind ourselves to take some action calculated to move us a notch closer to our goals and toward fulfillment as persons, and to recognize and be aware of the beauty around us. The proof of the greatness and truth of this piece of writing is in the fact that it successfully withstood the test of time and has endured for more than 4,000 years. It's as modern and important today as it was the day it first flashed across the mind of some person whose name has long been forgotten. And it'll be just as important to thinking men and women 4,000 years from today. For real truth is as ageless as the mountains, as enduring as the sea. Emerson wrote, There is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must take himself, for better or worse, as his portion, and that though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him but through the toil bestowed on that plot of ground which is given him to till. The power which resides in him is new in nature, and none but he knows what that is which he can do, nor does he know until he's tried. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. There is a bit of advice that a person would do well to reflect upon every morning of his life. No one can even estimate the number of people who live nervous, anxious, unhappy lives because they daily attempt the impossible, which is to be like someone else. There are people who don't realize the truth of Emerson's words that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide. He must have used the word suicide because we have to kill that which is natural in ourselves when we attempt to be like someone else. They need to recognize the truth, also, that the power that resides in them is new in nature, that it has never appeared before in just that way on earth, that if they'll learn about and develop their own powers, they'll have no need of envy or imitation. Envy is ignorance because it means a person is ignorant of his own powers and abilities, his one-of-a-kind natural talent. He's never looked within himself for his own road to greatness, but instead seeks it in the lives of others. And when he fails to succeed, as do those he envies, as fail he must because he can't possibly be exactly like them, his image of himself shrinks. Not understanding that he is unlike those he envies, he doesn't realize that this simple fact lies at the bottom of his failure. Nor does he understand that he can be as successful as anyone on earth if he will build upon that power that resides in him. As Emerson put it, the power which resides in him is new in nature, and none but he knows what that is which he can do, nor does he know until he's tried. This is why a parent is off base when he says to a child, Why aren't you like so-and-so, like a brother or some model child? Look what he's doing. The parent doesn't understand that it's a human impossibility for the child to be like so-and-so and and to do what he does in the same way. Instead, a parent would be wise to say, Don't worry about so-and-so. He's found his strength, and he's building on it. You have a strength of your own, and when you find it, you can build just as high. And then those great words, Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. When a person finds himself, when he stops imitating and envying others, there's something in his nature that says to him, This is it. You've found your road at last. Every person is born to be a star at something. The purpose of his or her life is to discover it, and then to spend his or her years building upon that plot of ground. It was given to him and to her to till. What makes you happy will depend upon your own personal nature, which is different in many ways from that of any other human being. To try to find happiness by doing what seems to make others happy is to fall headfirst into the identity trap. So writes Harry Brown in his book, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. Mine's an Avon paperback. He believes that there are two identity traps. One, the belief that you should be someone other than yourself. And two, the assumption that others will do things in the way that you would. Now, these are the basic traps of which many others are variations. In the first trap, you necessarily forfeit your freedom by requiring yourself to live in a stereotyped, predetermined way that doesn't consider your own desires, feeling, and objectives. The second trap is more subtle, but just as harmful to your freedom. 
When you expect someone to have the same ideas, attitudes, and feelings that you have, you expect him to act in ways that aren't in keeping with his nature. As a result, you'll expect and hope that people will do things they're not capable of doing. Others can suggest what you should do or what ought to make you happy, but they'll often be wrong. You have to determine for yourself who you are, what makes you happy, what you're capable of doing, and what you want to do. Be open to suggestions, but never forfeit the power to make the final decision yourself. Only then can you act in ways that will bring you happiness. You're in the identity trap when you let others determine what's right or wrong for you, when you live by unquestioned rules that define how you should act and think. You're in the identity trap, says Mr. Brown, when you try to be interested in something because it's expected of you, or when you try to do the things that others have said you should do, or when you try to live up to an image that others say is the only legitimate, valid image you're allowed to have. You're in the identity trap if you allow others to define labels and impose them upon you, such as going to PTA meetings because that's what so-called good parents are supposed to do or going to visit your parents every Sunday because a good child would never do less, or giving up your career because a so-called good wife puts her husband's career first. You're in the identity trap if you feign an interest in ecology to prove your civic interest, or give to the poor to prove you aren't selfish, or study dull subjects to appear to be intellectual. You're in the identity trap if you buy an expensive car to prove you're successful, or a small foreign car because your friends are anti-Detroit. Or if you shave every day to prove you're respectable, or let your hair grow long to prove you don't conform. In any of these ways, you allow someone else to determine what you should think and be. You deny your own self when you suppress desires that aren't considered legitimate, or when you try to appear to be having fun because everyone else is, or when you settle for a certain life because you've been told that's all you should expect in the world. A little book that's meant a great deal to me, and I suppose thousands of others, is As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. One of the chapters of the book is entitled Visions and Ideals, and it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever read. It goes like this. The dreamers are the saviors of the world. As the visible world is sustained by the invisible, so men, through all their trials and sins and sordid vocations, are nourished by the beautiful visions of their solitary dreamers. Humanity cannot forget its dreamers. It cannot let their ideals fade and die. It lives in them. It knows them as the realities which it shall one day see and know. Composer, sculptor, painter, poet, prophet, sage, these are the makers of the afterworld, the architects of heaven. The world is beautiful because they've lived. Without them, laboring humanity would perish. He who cherishes a beautiful vision, a lofty ideal in his heart, will one day realize it. Columbus cherished a vision of another world, and he discovered it. Copernicus fostered the vision of a multiplicity of worlds and a wider universe, and he revealed it. Buddha beheld the vision of a spiritual world of stainless beauty and perfect peace, and he entered into it. Cherish your visions. Cherish your ideals. Cherish the music that stirs in your heart, the beauty that forms in your mind, the loveliness that drapes your purest thoughts. For out of them will grow all delightful conditions, all heavenly environment. Of these, if you but remain true to them, your world will at last be built. To desire is to obtain. To aspire is to achieve. Shall man's basest desires receive the fullest measure of gratification and his purest aspirations starve for lack of sustenance? Such is not the law. Such a condition of things can never obtain. Ask and receive. Dream lofty dreams, and as you dream, so shall you become. Your vision is the promise of what you shall one day be. Your ideal is the prophecy of what you shall at last unveil. The greatest achievement was at first and for a time a dream. The oak sleeps in the acorn, the bird waits in the egg, and in the highest vision of the soul a waking angel stirs. Dreams are the seedlings of realities. Your circumstances may be uncongenial, but they shall not long remain so if you but perceive an ideal and strive to reach it. You cannot travel within and stand still without. You will realize the vision, not the idle wish, 
of your heart, be it base or beautiful, or a mixture of both, for you will always gravitate toward that which you secretly most love. Into your hands will be placed the exact results of your own thoughts. You will receive that which you earn, no more, no less. Dream lofty dreams, and as you dream, so shall you become. Your vision is the promise of what you shall one day be. Your ideal is the prophecy of what you shall at last unveil. Here's something worth keeping in mind. If one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. It was written by Henry Thoreau, and it contains a truth most people don't even dream exists. If they did, the entire country might be turned into total chaos. The truth most of us miss in that great quotation is that success, beyond anything we might now imagine, lies in wait for those who can put together enough courage to actually live the life they imagine. You know, most people live in two worlds. There's the real world, the world in which they move and work and live, the world of the nitty-gritty. And there's the world of the imagination, the world they would secretly like to live in. And what keeps them from moving from the world of reality into the world of their imagination is habit and the fear of falling flat on their faces in the attempt and losing even the little that they presently have and perhaps looking ridiculous in the eyes of their loved ones and friends. They're the Walter Middies of the world. We're all Walter Middies to some extent. What we fail to realize is what Thoreau discovered that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. Thoreau knew this because he did it. So did Paul Gauguin, the painter, so have thousands of others who have found to their delight and surprise that life pays off most handsomely when we're doing that which we most want to do, when we're actually living the life we've imagined for so long. Now, that doesn't mean that we run off after every vagrant whim, but it does mean that we should live the life that we know, deep down in our very being, we would most like to live. It means that we should be doing that which every indicator of our makeup, every fiber of our being tells us we should be doing, and has been telling us for some time. Gauguin didn't tear off to Tahiti the first time the delightful thought popped into his strange head, nor did Thoreau go to live at Walden Pond the first time the idea struck him to go off by himself and meditate and think and write and try to discover for himself what was important and what wasn't. But when an idea tugs at us day after day, year after year, when we think about it as we lie awake in bed or the first thing when we wake up every time there's a lull in our days, when it worries our consciousness like a puppy with a slipper, then it's time to do something about it. And even though making the move might seem to jeopardize everything of order in our lives, it's very likely, as Thoreau suggested, that we will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. The most commonly voiced thought after taking such a step is, why didn't I do this years ago? Emerson said a man should learn to detect and watch that gleam of light which flashes across his mind from within, more than the luster of the firmament of bards and sages. Yet he dismisses without notice his thought, because it's his. Once upon a time, there was a man who felt he'd reached the end of his rope. It seemed that all the interest had suddenly vanished from his life. His creative wells had seemingly dried up. He still had his work, but... It suddenly seemed meaningless to him. Even his family and his home receded darkly in his mind. Finally, nearing the point of desperation, he went to see his old friend, the family doctor. Well, the doctor listened to his story, saw the depth of his depression, and then asked him, When you were a child, what did you like to do best? And he answered, I like to visit the seashore. All right, the doctor said, you must do exactly as I tell you. I want you to spend all day tomorrow at the shore. Find a lonely stretch of beach and spend the entire day there from nine in the morning until six in the evening. Take nothing to read and do nothing calculated to distract you in any way. I'm going to give you four prescriptions in order. Take the first at nine, the second at twelve noon, the third at three o'clock, and the last at six. Don't look at them now. Wait until you arrive at the shore tomorrow morning. 
Well, the man promised he'd take the doctor's advice, and the next morning, a little before nine, he parked his car in a lonely stretch of beach. There was a strong wind blowing in from the sea, and the surf was high and pounding. He walked to a sand dune near the seething surf and sat down. He took out prescription number one, opened it, and read it. It said, Listen. That was all that was written on it, the one word, listen. And so for three hours, that's all he did. He listened to the sound of the buffeting wind and the lonely cries of the gulls. He listened to the sound of the booming surf. He sat quietly, and he listened. At noon, he took out and read the second prescription. It said simply, reach back. And so for the next three hours, he did just that. He let his mind go back as far as it could go, and he thought of all the incidents of his life that he could remember, the happy times, the good times, the struggles, and the successes. At three o'clock, he tore open the third prescription. It said, re-examine your motives. And this took so much intense thought and concentration that the remaining three hours slipped quickly by. For three hours, he re-examined his motives, his reasons for living and moving closer to fulfillment. He clarified and restated his goals. And at six o'clock, under a gray, darkening sky with a taste of salt spray on the wind, he read the fourth and final prescription. It read, Write your worries in the sand. There had been one thing that had been worrying him particularly, so he walked to the hard sand and with a stick wrote this worry in the sand and stood looking at it for a moment. Then as he walked toward his car, he looked back and saw that the incoming tide had already erased his worry. He got in his car and drove homeward. My old friend Norman Vincent Peale told me that story some years back about the man, the seashore, and the four prescriptions. Listen, reach back, re-examine your motives, and then write your worries in the sand. Dr. Kenneth Hildebrand, for many years a Midwestern minister and author of the book Achieving Real Happiness, told of a woman who was married to a cruel, shiftless alcoholic. When drunk, he would beat her and the children. Debts accumulated, often there was no food in the house. When the eldest child was seven, the husband deserted his wife. She had no money, no credit, no business training. She had to undergo surgery, thus adding to her mountain of debt. A few months later, the youngest child became ill and died. When the father received the news by wire, he telegraphed in reply, Terrible shock. Sorry to hear the news. His heartlessness so angered the woman that she resolved to rear the children without him at whatever cost to herself. The following nine years, she toiled at any work available. She never lost her determination or her sense of humor, and she prided herself in not saying or doing anything to turn the children against their father. She managed to keep the home together and to make it a cheery one. At the end of nine years, she married a man who loved her and the children devotedly. To encourage other women undergoing difficult experiences, she said, Any woman can wring happiness out of life if she's worthy of happiness. Her words are worth remembering. Her happiness and well-being did not depend upon circumstances. She was superior to them. She rose above them. Now, no woman would enjoy going through what this woman had to endure, and every life has its problems. But if we permit our circumstances to dictate how we feel and act, we're relinquishing control of our own lives. And it's our attitude toward others and the world that determines what happens to us. If the woman I mentioned had not developed her cheerful, friendly, successful attitude toward her life, the chances are excellent that she never would have found the right man and married again. A popular fallacy held by almost all young people and a large segment of the older adults is that happiness hinges on pleasant circumstances and congenial surroundings. These people think that if their circumstances were better, they'd be happy. This isn't true. If a person cannot find happiness in his daily life now, unless he wakes up, he will never be happy, regardless of his circumstances. The fact is, whether or not we admit it to ourselves, that genuine happiness is hidden in the quiet simplicities and fundamental virtues of life. These cannot be purchased, even though you could afford to pay a king's ransom, and they at the same time exist for anyone. Every day of our lives is either successful or unsuccessful. 
If we permit the success of our days to depend upon things such as the weather, the talk and the actions of other people, and if we concentrate not on what we have, but rather on those things we do not have, well, we become little more than small mirrors of our surroundings. What we should remember is that each of us, in reality, shapes his world in his own likeness. If ours is not a happy world, it's because that's the way we see it. This is Earl Nightingale. I want to talk to you about one of the greatest discoveries of man. When I learned about this discovery, it turned my world upside down for the better and made it possible for me to have everything I've ever wanted since. And I know it'll do the same for you if you will put the discovery to work in your life. The discovery was made in the 19th century by the famous Viennese physician, Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis. He called his discovery the unconscious or subconscious mind. That is to say, as I'm sure you know, that each one of us has two minds, although of course they're interconnected and surely part of the same mysterious entity. We have our conscious minds and our unconscious minds, more popularly known as our subconscious, sub meaning below the surface. In fact, Freud himself said that the conscious mind is like a fountain playing in the sun, while below lies the great ocean of the subconscious mind. Now, the comparison, as far as anyone knows, is a good one. Many people had believed in the existence of the subconscious mind before Freud, but he really proved that it existed and exercises an enormous influence on our lives. And many of the things Freud believed and wrote about are doubted in some circles today, but not the discovery of the subconscious mind. That's accepted as fact everywhere. So each of us has a subconscious mind, and it exerts a tremendous influence on his life. So let me see if I can explain how a part of the subconscious mind works. First, understand that it's big. All we know about it points to that, and is the storehouse of everything we've ever experienced in our lives. But it's believed to be much more than that. It seems to have or be connected to great powers latent within it, and it seems to work in many ways like some mysterious supercomputer. But standing at the entrance to the subconscious mind and screening much that comes along is the conscious mind. We might compare the conscious mind to the computer operator in that it determines what goes in. Not everything, because the subconscious is aware of everything that goes on about us, everything that comes to us through our five senses. Our senses are the subconscious mind's means of contact with the world. Now understand, the subconscious mind has no control whatever over what goes into it. It's passive. It receives and acts upon what is received. It has no way of distinguishing between what we call right or wrong, good or bad. Like a computer, it simply receives the information and then takes the appropriate action regarding it. Now let me give you an easy example of how it works. Think right now of your telephone number. Have you got it? Okay, that's one of the ways the subconscious works. Your telephone number is stored, as is everything else you've ever experienced in your subconscious mind, is subject to recall. Now, when I said think of your telephone number, I instructed your conscious mind, the fountain playing in the sunlight. It immediately triggered the response of the subconscious and out popped the exact number you wanted. Just like a printout on a computer, isn't it? Now, here's another example. I want you to remember what you were doing and where you were when you learned of the tragic death of President John F. Kennedy. It's a very clear picture, isn't it? But did you notice that this time you were aware of an emotional response as well as the memory of the exact event? It was Dr. Penfield in his work at McGill University in Canada who discovered that memories, along with the original emotion that accompanied them, are stored together in the brain. Have you ever heard a particular piece of music or smelled something that triggered a sudden wave of emotion or brought back a sudden memory? Sure you have. Those were cases of your other senses getting responses, voluntary or involuntary, from the great warehouse of the subconscious mind. All right, now let me tell you about the discovery that revolutionized my life and the lives of many thousands of others who have learned to use the power of the subconscious mind to bring them everything they want in life. Now, when I say everything they want, everything I have ever wanted, I'm referring, of course, to those things that are within our power to achieve, although nobody is exactly sure just how far those powers go. I'm talking about such things as finding the person we want to find, achieving the income we want, having the things we want, things such as the home we want to own and live in, the car we want to drive, the trips we want to take, the boat or the trailer we want to have, the degree of education we want to achieve. Now, in most cases, since the medical people tell us that at least 70%, some say 90% of all illness is brought about by emotional problems of various kinds, we could even enjoy better, more abundant health through the intelligent and proper use of the mind, perhaps. 
How do we use the power of the subconscious mind to achieve these things? Well, let me tell you how. I'm not only going to tell you how to get the things and conditions you want to bring about in the future, but I'll tell you at the same time how you've obtained most of the things you have obtained and brought about most of the conditions you've experienced in the past. Now, remember two important points I mentioned before. One, the great ocean of our subconscious mind is passive. It only receives and acts upon what is fed into it. It knows neither good nor bad, right or wrong. It can only do our bidding. It's a great and powerful servant, and its only direction is the direction we give it. And two, whenever we want something, we want it first in our conscious mind. And at that instant, it comes up against the screen of logic that stands between our conscious and our subconscious minds. Now, at this screen, we make a conscious evaluation as to whether or not what we want is logical. Now, this screen of logic can be compared to the governor of an engine. The governor is set to control the engine's speed, and unless the setting is changed, the engine can go no faster. Well, each of us has such a governor set on our screen of logic, and the setting changes from time to time as we grow older and more mature. When we were children, the governor was set for childish things. As we grew older, we gradually advanced the setting to include more and more things. But remember that we in our environment do the setting. So whenever we see or think of something we want, it comes up against this screen of logic, which has been set to filter out all that we do not think logical for us. Let me give you an example. Think now of a 60-foot yacht. You got the picture? See her there in the water, all white and gleaming in the sunshine? Now, do you want that yacht? Do you want to buy that yacht? It'll cost you $150,000. Do you want it for your very own? Now, most people will screen the 60-foot yacht out. It will never really pass as an order to the subconscious mind for two reasons. One, most people don't want a 60-foot yacht and wouldn't know what to do with it if they had it. Two, most people really believe getting enough money together so that they can throw away $150,000 on a yacht is simply out of the question. So it doesn't pass the screen of logic. Now, that's what keeps people from seriously wanting things that are not right for them. But remember, there are people, many thousands of them, whose screens will let that 60-foot yacht come sailing right through, and who now have 60-foot or much larger yachts. It all depends on the person, doesn't it? All right, now let's look at the things you've obtained in the past. Include in these the person you married, if you're married, the place you live in, and all of your present possessions. Everything you have, with the exception of gifts, was once an idea in your conscious mind. And everything you have once came up against your screen of logic, just like that 60-foot yacht. Only everything you have passed through it. Not the first time, maybe. Sometimes you thought you weren't quite ready yet, and you put some things off for later, but eventually everything you've ever obtained through your own actions passed through the screen and was planted in your subconscious mind. And the really important things, maybe they're no longer important to you, but they were at the time, the really important things were planted in your subconscious mind with emotion. And when you plant something in the subconscious mind with emotion, it's like wrapping a seed in fertilizer before you plant it. It grows faster and better. Where you live, your car, your clothes, your job, your income, everything was once an idea in your conscious mind, was stopped for inspection at the screen of logic, which had been set by the governor at that time, and was permitted to pass into the subconscious mind. As everything you ever wanted or wanted to do passed into the subconscious mind, it was simply accepted, good or bad, right or wrong, stupid or intelligent, makes no difference. It was accepted and acted upon. It might have been a decision to obtain a $500 a week position, a decision to buy a $30,000 home, or the decision to rob a bank, or start on drugs, or buy a beautiful new car, or graduate from school, or not graduate from school, or ask someone to marry you. Whatever all those decisions were which passed through the screen into the subconscious mind, and most especially those that were wrapped in a strong emotion, they all came to pass, didn't they? Can you think of anything you have ever wanted with all your heart since becoming an adult that you have not obtained or are not now in the process of obtaining? Well, do you realize what that means? It means that your subconscious mind is an enormously powerful servant that gets you anything you seriously want. It means that you've been telling your own fortune, doesn't it? Now, I don't know where you set your governor. That's your business. Each of us has a different setting. And as I said, we change the setting as we become more confident of our powers. But if you understand what I've been saying here, you probably realize that you've set your governor too low, maybe much too low. In fact, you may not have realized you were doing the setting. 
In fact, you may not have been doing the setting. There are millions of people in our society all over the world who permit others to set their governors for them. They do this without realizing they're doing it. They do it by conforming without question to those about them. They do it by selling themselves short and making the assumption that they're not able to do any better than those by whom they're surrounded. They're copycats, not because they want to be copycats. It's just they've never thought much about it. Our subconscious minds, and remember yours is as good as anybody else's, are incredibly fertile. Anything that's passed through the screen and planted well in them will start to grow into reality. If it's reinforced by repetitive thinking over and over again and fertilized with emotion and the belief, the faith that it will come to pass in our lives, it will in fact come to pass. I like the phrase come to pass because it's true of everything in our lives. It comes to pass, as all will pass from our lives eventually. And that's what gives meaning and a kind of urgency to our lives and a bit of sadness and poignancy to everything, too. But that's only because we don't understand as much as we should. Fear of any kind is ignorance. Whenever we're afraid, it's because we don't know enough. If we understood enough, we'd never be afraid. Now, we still don't know very much about man or his incredible mind, but we know a little. We know we have a subconscious, and we know a little about how it works. We don't know what electricity is either, but we're smart enough to push a button or flip a switch. It's the same with the mystery of our minds. We've been told by many of the wisest people who ever lived that we have powers greater than we imagine. We've been told that we can work what seem to be miracles. We can bring about the lives we want to live, do the things we want to do, have the things we want to have all the years of our lives, if we but know it, if we will but learn how to do it. Your world is a living expression of how you are using and have used your mind. Your future will be determined by how you use it from now on. Your Lead the Field program will tell you how to put this great force for good to work in your life. I can truthfully tell you this. If I didn't have this information, I'd gladly pay anything for it. It's brought me everything I ever seriously wanted, and it's also brought me and those close to me meaning, order, and rich satisfaction in their lives. I hope you and the members of your family will really put Lead the Field to work for you. I hope you'll make the concepts it contains a habit-knit part of your lives. Now on side two of this cassette, I want to tell you about the one person who really controls your life. Listen carefully. The more you know about this person, the better off you'll be in everything you do. The great Dr. William James said, The greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. And he also said, We need only in cold blood act as if the thing in question were real, and it will become infallibly real by growing into such a connection with our life. Now, these words of William James are among the many echoes from the past of what I said on side one of this cassette. Whatever we plant in our subconscious mind and nourish with repetition and emotion will one day become a reality. The one clear truth that appears universally in the writings of all the great philosophers and the biographies of mankind's leaders throughout the ages is that we become what we think about most of the time. Now this means that each of us shapes his own environment, his own destiny, for better or worse, during his one chance at life. It means that your future is not predetermined that you can make it happen. And your success in life has nothing to do with luck or whom you know or where you were born. It means that no one has to be controlled by his environment or by outside forces of any kind. Not if he refuses to conform, to blindly follow the great majority of people who historically take the big broad road to nowhere. Not if he learns to articulate and define the vague, hazy prodding of his deep-rooted desires and find that these things can be his where he is now. This, of course, is another echo from the past. It was Henry David Thoreau who wrote, We have only to move confidently in the direction of our dreams to meet with a success unexpected in common hours. And that's what your Lead the Field series is all about. It provides ideas and principles to help you systematically exploit your own unique qualities and talents as a person. In short, again with a bow to Thoreau, to march to the beat of your own drum. Lead the Field is not an attempt to tell you how to live your life. That's your business, nor is it a collection of pleasantries, platitudes, and polyhenna. It simply provides the information you need to shape your environment in the form you choose. It gives you the kind of information that is not taught in school, in the service, or in company training manuals, and that's seldom acquired in the home. 
Yet, from both a selfish and altruistic viewpoint, this is the most valuable information anyone could possibly possess. This audio program is a concentrated listening and thinking system for continuing education that will have a direct bearing on every day of your life. By listening, we absorb things easily, almost without any conscious effort. As children, we learned almost everything, even how to read by listening. And by repeated listening to each of these sessions, new ideas and ways of doing things become a habit-knit part of you, safely stored in the memory bank of your subconscious. Lead the Field is actually a blueprint for achievement of any kind. It's the result of more than 30 years of research into what makes people successful in every department of living. And it's truly an encyclopedia of success for the entire family. If you have youngsters... You'll find it just as valuable to them as it is to you, maybe more so. The earlier a person makes this information a part of his or her thinking, the better. And it will be just as effective in promoting greater understanding and success in school as it will in later life. You'll find 12 sessions in the Lead the Field series, each designed to help you enrich your life with the great thoughts of the greatest minds in recorded history. Number one is called The Magic Word. In it, you'll learn about a word, a simple word which, more than any other, shapes our destiny. Fully understanding and utilizing the magic word can change a human life as dramatically as walking from a darkened room into the bright, clear light of day. This word is a two-edged sword, which can bring us the success we seek, or, if we use it wrongly, a life of disappointment and frustration. Number two is called Acres of Diamonds. It proves to you that, whether you know it or not, you are right this minute in the middle of more opportunity than you can develop in a lifetime. It tells you how to see opportunities in the common, everyday things by which you're constantly surrounded. Number three is titled, A Worthy Destination. It's concerned with how you can accomplish your goals within the framework of your present company and industry, starting where you are right now. Any person making this information a part of his way of thinking can accomplish far more in one year than the average person does in five. Number four is called Miracle of Your Mind. Regardless of the vocation in which you're engaged, this message tells of a way to use a single hour a day in a way that can bring you unbelievable results. Number five, Destiny in the Balance, tells about and clearly defines a law which is at the base of all economic and personal well-being. It tells you of a simple thing you can do every day, which will enormously increase your effectiveness and bring you the respect and admiration of others, as well as a far more bountiful life. Seed for Achievement is the title of number six. This tells why some of the most so-called average appearing people frequently achieve so much in life, and why others who seemingly work hard and long all the years of their lives seem many times to miss out on any real success. It explains in detail how anyone, anyone at all, can achieve the success he seeks. Number seven is called, It's Easier to Win, and goes on to prove it. This message cuts through the mountains of confusion as to why we act, talk, and conduct ourselves as we do, and why we might be on the road to disappointment unless we make a very small but vitally important shift in our lives. Now, unless you're already in the top five percent, this message will open your eyes to something which... Well, historically, it's been known by only about 5% of the people, perhaps less. Number eight asks the question, how much are you worth? It shows you how to adopt the same practices which have built our largest and most successful corporations. It specifically gives you three things to do that can easily be done by anyone, which will greatly improve the present and guarantee your success in the future. Number nine is called, let's talk about money. Now here's a subject which has been one of the world's favorites since the first coin was fashioned in Asia Minor about 700 years B.C. This message gets rid of the confusion as to how much money is enough, how to decide on the amount you want to earn, and then how to earn it. Number 10 is titled, One Thing You Can't Hide. It tells you of the discovery made by one of our leading universities of a single factor which controls to an enormous extent the money we will earn, the neighborhood in which we will live, and the group with which we will associate. A Chicago University professor has said that this message alone could mean a hundred thousand dollars difference in a person's lifetime income. Number 11 is called Today's Greatest Adventure. It tells why so many millions are dependent upon national economic cycles, general conditions as to whether or not they live well or poorly. 
It tells us how to cut ourselves away from those who live so precariously, even in the richest era in history, and how to control our own circumstances. And finally, number 12, your final session in Lead the Field, called The Man on the White Horse, tells you what it is that every business on earth is looking for and how you can supply it. And that's it, your blueprint to success. You can have the things you want, all of them, and you will have them if you make these messages a part of your way of thinking, a part of your way of life. If you give a blueprint to a skillful builder, it will not be a matter of chance or luck to successfully complete the structure. He merely begins at the beginning and follows the plan step by step to its completion. Well, the same is true for our Lead the Field program. If you will follow it, the results will be automatic every time with every person. You don't have to take my word for it or even that of the tens of thousands of people you're now joining, people who've used and continue to use this blueprint of success. Just begin listening. As you begin, let me give you, by way of saying thanks for the wise investment of money you've made in cassette learning and the equally wise investment of time you're going to make, some helpful information on the art of listening. Of course, in 30 years of broadcasting, recording, and public speaking, I've accumulated enough ideas and formulated enough theories on this subject to talk for hours, even days, and probably bore you to death. To try to avoid that possibility, let's confine our discussion to cassette listening and be very brief about it. The main idea behind learning by listening to cassettes is that whenever your eyes and hands are busy, you can put your ears and mind to profitable use. Now, that's one of those ideas that's as great as it is simple. Whenever your eyes and hands are busy, you can put your ears and mind to profitable use. Do you know how many eyes and hands hours you have every day, every week, every year? Hours when you're driving, dressing, eating alone, relaxing, or just puttering around? Well, one expert in this field claims that of the 8,760 hours we all have in a year, even the busiest person has more than 500 of these hours, and another points out that this is the equivalent of 10 college course semesters every year. Now, this is a gold mine of opportunity to become much more effective at everything you do, a more relaxed, happy, in-charge person in every aspect of your life. How do you do this? You do it the same way an athlete, a neurosurgeon, a great teacher, a wonderful mother, or an outstanding person in any field does it. You acquire the habit of doing things right automatically, and you do them in a relaxed way. A couple of places where it's easy to acquire the habit of cassette listening are in your bath or dressing room and in your car. Now, I know lots of people who always keep a cassette in the play position in their cars. When they switch on the ignition, they automatically start a listening experience. This can work with the switch for the bathroom light, too, and in many other equally automatic situations. In planes or trains or waiting rooms and in a cassette corner of your den or office. And you should always try to listen in a relaxed way. You don't have to concentrate. You don't have to work at it. It's interesting and it's fun. And that's enough. Perhaps the proof of this is that most of us know by heart the radio and TV commercials of the big national advertisers, and I'm sure nobody ever tried to learn them. The fact is that not listening can sometimes be a good way to implant a useful idea directly into your subconscious. It's my theory that that area of your mind is very smart, that it occasionally reaches out for ideas to meet its needs, needs that the conscious mind may not be aware of. Now, don't get me wrong. Not listening or rather just listening in a relaxed way without tense, avid concentration, isn't an excuse for not thinking. Thinking is the most important thing you do, and good cassettes are designed to stimulate thinking, not replace it with some sort of rote learning. You can think very much faster than anyone can talk, or you can listen. And really good talkers and listeners never let either talking or listening get in the way of their thinking. Good cassette listeners frequently listen with a finger near the stop button and writing tools at hand. As soon as an idea springs to mind, they stop the cassette, jot down the idea, and mull it over, asking themselves, Is this really a good idea? Can I apply it in my life and work? When? How? And they record their answers and do something about them. To my mind, this is what cassette learning is all about. So relax, don't strain, just begin listening. Let your ears put that wonderful gold mine between your ears to profitable work. You'll be thrilled and delighted by the good things that start happening right away. And they never stop. They literally go on and on forever. 
As long as you take time to listen and think, you will constantly get new ideas, new reminders of things that will increase your awareness, improve your performance, revitalize your career, and help you achieve everything you want from life. Thank you.